Welcome to our latest RightScale webinar here. We're joined by New Relic today, and we're going to talk about deploying and managing Rails apps in the cloud. So thanks, everyone, for joining. Quickly go through our panel today. Uh, this is Josh Frazier. I'm the Vice President of Business Development with RightScale. Uh, I'm joined by Edward Goldberg, our Chief Evangelist at RightScale. And then we have Matthew Small and Hunter Williams on the Q&A uh, chat log, so fire away your questions and, and they'll address them. Happy to be joined by Steve Hudson from the New Relic side. He's Director of Field Services. And then also on Q&A from New Relic is Bill Kaiser. Quickly on our agenda today, um, we're going to immediately jump to a brief demo. Ed, Ed's going to give you a quick preview of the power of using New Relic. Uh, and then we're going to jump back, talk a little bit about RightScale, our cloud management platform, and some specifics on the partnership with New Relic. Uh, then we're going to turn it over and do a much deeper dive into how you would go about setting up New Relic in the cloud using RightScale and the various monitoring attributes around Rails performance. Um, as always, please fire away any and all questions at any time during the webinar. We'll answer them as we get them on the chat logs. And then, as usual, we'll also be sticking around and keeping those chat logs open. Um, so please feel free to hang around after the webinar is completed, and we'll continue to answer questions. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Ed, who's going to give us a quick sneak peek at uh, using New Relic. Well, thanks a lot, Josh. Um, today I'm going to be doing two things. I'm going to give you a brief demonstration on how to add the New Relic plugin to your next Ruby on Rails application. And um, I'm scaring the wrong screen, guys. OK. The, the next demonstration of how do you add Ruby on Rails to your next application using the RightScale dashboard? Um, first of all, I'd like to show you a little Ruby on Rails demonstration that I've set up. It's just a little wiki. And I've put this up on the Ruby on the RightScale dashboard. One of the things RightScale has been good at since day one is showing you really good analytics, both of the database, the disk drives, CPU utilization. It's really good at telling you what the machine's doing underneath your Ruby on Rails application. And it's a really wonderful environment for Rails because you do get a full server platform to deploy on with full SSH access. By adding the Ruby on Rails to the new Relic credentials, so you plug in a, a, the new Relic RPM, you create a new Relic account. What you end up with is the ability to dive into the analytics of your application. Here's just one sneak peek of what we'll see later in the presentation where you can literally go down to the lines of code, the controllers, the actual SQL queries. So without further ado, I'll send you back for some slideware to Josh, and we'll go through more about what it's all about. And then I'm going to give an in-depth explanation of how to add the plugin to your next Ruby on Rails presentation and use the tight integration with RightScale. Back to you, Josh. Great. Thanks, Ed. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, RightScale and the New Relic partnership. So hopefully most of you are familiar with RightScale at this point. Uh, if not, we're a cloud management platform, uh, really focused on filling the gap between the applications that you'd like to run and the lower level cloud infrastructure. Uh, there are three core areas of value that we deliver. The first is around a host of automation. We look to automate everything that we possibly can within uh, the overall lifecycle management of a server in the cloud, things like auto scaling and configuration management. Uh, secondly, we have cloud-ready solutions. Uh, specifically, these are server templates and write scripts designed around common workloads that our customers need in the cloud. Uh, these are pre-configured and also provided at source, so if you need to make any modifications, you're free to do so. Um, here's where New Relic fits in. You'll hear a little bit more about that in a second, but the idea is if you want to make uh, New Relic part of your deployment within RightScale, uh, most of the work is already done for you. Uh, finally, we complement that with expertise and support. We've been at this really since day one in the cloud, and we're here to help you get up and running and deal with your management on an ongoing basis. Uh, RightScale is designed to be multi-cloud. Um, we're happy to announce that we have full production deployment capabilities now with both Amazon clouds, uh, US and EU. 
uh, as well as pending support for Rackspace, FlexiScale, GoGrid, and Eucalyptus, and most recently Sun. So uh, Sun announced their cloud intentions a few weeks ago, and RightScale will be supporting Sun as well. Our specific focus is on the full lifecycle management of deploying in the cloud. Um, this is really key to our approach, and it's a deployment methodology that delivers cl cloud-ready servers, which are tailored specifically to your applications and your deployment needs in the cloud. Um, our management tools will look to automate common lifecycle tasks, and our go-to-market approach is to focus on specific customer needs about how to get up and run quickly and how to deal with ongoing tasks as they occur. It's with this in mind that we introduced our ISV program. Uh, what the ISV program is all about is working with various technology providers to help fill the gaps with the various different workloads that our customers want to run. Um, we look for you know, approaches that are very agile, both in their delivery of the technology as well as their business model. Um, the end result of this is ISVs are building server templates and write scripts on our platform and really reducing the barrier to entry to help deploy their apps into the cloud and the customers that wish to run them. How we prioritize ISVs is strictly based on you, our users, and our customers. Um, in the case of New Relic, we have customers specifically asking for better visibility into their production Rails applications. So we partnered up with New Relic, and what we found is New Relic is a perfect solution for, for providing performance monitoring on your Rails apps. Um, it gives you visibility into how the application actually consumes resources. It allows you to really design and fix problems uh, before it impacts your customers. And then we're also pleased to announce that their pricing model allows us to offer RPM Lite uh, as free and available to any and all RightScale users, including uh, our developer account users as well as our premium accounts. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, who's going to give you a little bit closer look at New Relic, who they are, and what their application is all about. Thanks, Josh. So let me give you a, a quick uh, flyby, just a couple of slides on what uh, New Relic does. and. Uh, and then we'll jump into the demo. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, New Relic makes uh, your Rails applications perform and scale. Uh, we essentially give you deep, real-time visibility into your production apps, enabling you to, to quickly and, and cost-effectively detect and, and get to the root cause of problems. And that's something that not all products do, and we feel like that's a unique aspect of our product, is giving you that visibility at a deep level uh, inside your production apps. Now, our product is uh, called RPM and it runs as a lightweight agent inside your app. Uh, it, 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 it reports metrics back to our server where you can then log in and view, view the metrics through a browser. And here's a couple of uh, quick uh, bullet points on uh, what customers like about New Relic. And uh, number one there is quick and easy to install. Uh, it essentially installs as a plug-in and can literally be installed in just a couple of minutes. We have a very low total cost of ownership, no hardware, we're a pure software as a service uh, kind of a product, and we, uh, we have a tiered pricing model, by the way, where uh, you, can, you can actually get a, a light version that is free to fully supported versions with uh, a tiered uh, pricing model for those, respectively. But the key, uh, the real key point to what we do is the triple play you see there in the middle, and that is the monitoring and troubleshooting and tuning. And uh, it's, uh, that's, that's what we feel like makes our product unique. And it's by monitoring your app 24 by 7 that you can uh, quickly detect when problems occur and, and, and diagnose what's going on. And, and conversely, if you're not doing this 24 by 7, you may miss uh, critical data points or metrics uh, that can be key in helping you resolve those issues. And so likewise, tuning, uh, if, you're, if you're not monitoring it on a regular basis or, or on an ongoing basis, it could be uh, uh, difficult to see how you're improving or degrading performance over time. And so, just real quickly, we, we have uh, roughly 1,500 customers today running RPM in production. We have uh, roughly another 2,000 in pre-production. So we're used for both uh, production level apps as well as staging and testing. Uh, we run uh, everywhere from single host machines with a few instances up to uh, several hundred machines running thousands of instances. We have uh, customers in, in both those ranges. So we, we really cover the gamut from the, the, the environments that you run to, uh, to, to various sizes. So that's, uh, that's briefly it. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ed, I believe, uh, to start off our demonstration. Yeah, as usual, what we're going to do is we're going to 
show you how to actually do this. Um, what I'm trying to put together here is enough information so your first time trying to use Ruby on Rails with WriteScale and plug in RPM from New Relic is a pretty seamless operation. So what you're seeing right here is the standard WriteScale deployment uh, web website. And I'm looking here at the design server, sorry, the design server templates menu. And these are all the best practice templates provided. As you can see, we have Hadoop and LAMP servers and Apache servers. And there's a lot of pages here. So let's just filter down to only the ones that are based on Rails with this wonderful filter function we have here. And you can see that we have a collection of Rails application. Uh, the WriteScale dashboard in general is very friendly to Rails because it's built out of Ruby on Rails. And uh, we actually use the same software we're, we're actually providing as templates here today. So what I'm going to show you how to do is take our Ruby on Rails all-in-one trial template. And I recommend using this one for a first trial because all-in-one means there's basically one server, 10 cents an hour, that's going to set you up with a full Ruby on Rails environment that you can plug in the new Relic RPM. And you can also add your application. I, I've added a little wiki. Uh, it's called InSticky. And it comes from the gem store. Um, so step number one is grab your template from the best practice right scale templates and clone it. So why clone it is your first step. Because the next thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to alter this template to plug in New Relic, to add the extra script, we call them write scripts, to this template, which allows us to plug in, as he said, <clears throat> and I'll ask Steve to chime in at this point and explain what's going on. When I plug in this template, What's happening at this script? What is it actually doing to their Rails application? Uh, it's simply installing a uh, Rails plugin. And so there's, there's really literally zero configuration you have to do, and uh, the script will install the plugin, and when you launch it, it'll connect back to our server. Oh, okay. So um, I grab a hold of the app relic, the application uh, RPM, and I tell it to add it to the boot scripts over here using this add to boot script function. So it adds it as the last step. Now this is important. Remember, you always want to add the new Relic RPM after you've fully configured your application because it's going to plug it into your running or ongoing Ruby on Rails application. So if it isn't there, it can't really plug it in. So it's got to be the last step. Oh, by the way, it is possible to also add this later. So if I were to add it to the operational scripts, I could plug it back into a new version or plug it into a running Ruby on Rails application. You would briefly pause the application and plug in the new Relic RPM. Now that I've created this new template, which is just the same as before, it's the Rails all-in-one trial, but I've added RPM. So I'm going to go edit the name so I'll remember, um, plus RPM. So now I have a private copy of this template, which contains all the best practice of WriteScale setting up a server in EC2 that runs Ruby on Rails. And at the very last step, we plugged in New Relic. So now we only have one more thing we have to do to make this thing go live. We have to add the credentials. To do that, we go to the report settings, New Relic. Now when I go there, I'm going to see the ongoing New Relic, because obviously you can only log into this once. So I'm going to flip over to another screen here for a moment just a different account that hasn't been currently logged in to New Relic, and show you what you'll see the first time. I want you to click on either existing New Relic credentials, if you're a current New Relic user, and then you'll get the number or the cipher we need, or create a new account if you don't have one. And this is going to create a light account, right, Steve? That's correct. So the account you're going to get, you can upgrade later um, to the higher settings. But the first thing you're going to need after this step is going to be your credentials. So let me flip back to mine. There we go. Now I'm back in my account. Um, and this is what it looks like after you've started the application. Let's go to Manage Credentials so you can see what the credential looks like that we're looking for. So this long string is the credential used by New Relic inside their plugin. So we need to add this credential to our credential storage. So I simply select the entire credential. I'm going to be using the edit copy uh, punch function over here. So I now have the new relic credential in my cut buffer. 
I then go over to Design Credentials. So I'm now in the area of RightScale. For people that are new with RightScale, this is an area we use to store sometimes secrets, but not always secrets. Sometimes these are passwords. Sometimes they're just pieces of information I'm going to be using in many deployments. Um, but one of the nice parts about it is it does keep a secret very nicely. So in this case, we're going to keep our secret credential in our credential store. I do that by clicking on New Credential. What a new credential does is it opens up a window that allows me to add to my credential store the, the new key uh, from RPM. Okay? So I now have my RPM key named. I'm going to use my paste function to paste in the credential and make really, really sure we didn't get any extra spaces in there. Okay, it looks really good. If it's a secret, I wouldn't want to paste it here because then you could see it in the description field. So in this case, it is a secret. So this will be my key for RPM New Relic. So that's all that's going to show on the screen. And hit Save. This stores this information in a database in encrypted form so other people can't see it. In some cases, you'll see in my credentials, I'll make the description actually the value of the credential because it's not a secret. In other cases, like my SVN password, I don't want anybody to see, so I'll just say the password. So here we are. The new relic key is now available to any template that I need to use it for. So we'll go back to our server templates. I had cloned this template into private, you remember. That allowed me to keep this template in my local templates. But like before, there are a lot of templates. So let's type Rails again to filter down the list to only the ones that I'm working on right now. This was the one I was working on. So I click on RightScale on the nickname on the far left. That gets me into the Ruby on Rails template with RPM. The next thing I need to do is add that key so that when you launch any server with this template, it will get the correct key to talk to New Relic. I use the Edit button on the template to do that. Once I've edited the template, right, I can then go in and I can find the key for New Relic. That's this value right here. Watch out. Pull down on this menu, click Credentials, not Keys. I know that's a little confusing, but we put it in the Credential Store, so it's a key in the Credential Store. I guess that makes sense. Then I'm going to add that key to this application. Note from this point forward, I don't see the secret. It's now in a secret in the storage, and it'll be passed down to the plugin when we launch this server. Okay? I click Save. So I've now created a complete template for Ruby on Rails, all in one trial, and I've added to it the serial number or the password required by New Relic. Now let's go back to the Manage tab. For people new to, Ruby, to uh, RightScale, we collect servers in what we call deployments. Deployments are just collections of servers or groupings of servers, groupings of instances that I'm launching. I've called this group Ruby because these are all Ruby applications. And I have in my Ruby deployment two servers that are actually running right now. But I'm going to add one more to show you how to do it. I could add a server in Europe or I can add a server in the U.S. I choose to add it from the U.S. server bank. So this is going to go to AWS U.S and add one more server to my deployment called Rails. Well, we built our deployment in the private area, so I expect to find it in private. And then if I go down here to all the things I have in the private store, I can find my new relic that I've just created, which is the um, all-in-one trial that I added to the RPM, which would be this one right here. So Rails all-in-one trial, that's the one I want you to start from for your first trial. Remember, it's only 10 cents an hour to run these servers, so I encourage you to run one of these for an hour and just see how it works, and then later on maybe add your application. So I click on RPM, so now I have the right one. I'm launching this in the EC2 US area. I'm going to give it the uh, nickname of Webinar, for example. Um, this selects which key you use, and I have lots of possible keys here. So let's just use uh, the demo. Um, I can select security groups. We can put it in the default security groups. We'll put it with all the other machines, 
or I could put in a separate security group. This allows you to do sort of firewall control or access control to your machines. EC2 US at 1A means that I'm putting it in the availability zone 1A in the US. At the moment, I'm not attaching an elastic IP. I haven't set one up for this webinar, but I could just as well grab another EIP and have a static IP associated with this server when I launch it. But this is just a quick demo, so I haven't set one up. So I've now added a new server and shown you all the steps required to start with a basic template, add the RPM to it, and get ready to launch. The next step is go all the way over here to the right-hand side. Don't click on the red X. That deletes it. Click on the Launch button. When you hover over the button, it will say Launch. So I'll click on the Launch button, and it's going to let me review all of the parameters we've set up. I'm not going to go through the entire set here. There's a lot of detail, but the first thing I want to say here is that all of this was set up with the template, so you don't have to actually answer all these questions the first time around. And the next time around, these are a good example of how to answer the questions correctly. The most important one, remember, was we added the new relic key, and it seems to be correct. We may have had a gem list that we wanted to add to add a few more gems to our deployment. I could go on forever. A lot of detail here. But without further ado, let's click the Launch button. You don't start spending money until you actually click this Launch button. That's when a server gets allocated. So defining servers, defining templates, writing scripts, all happens outside of EC2. And when a server starts coming up, you'll notice an up arrow. See the nice little up arrow here? That means your server is being launched. In about three minutes from now, we're going to see this server up and running, and we'll be able to see our application. So instead of waiting for it to get done, I'm going to go to the already baked cake fresh out of the oven, the Ruby on Rails demo I already had, and show you a little bit more about what you'd see inside a server that's actually up and running. First of all, it's an operational server it's successfully launched. Second of all, this is the DNS address provided to us with the DNS name by EC2. And if I click on this, you can actually walk in and see the web service created by my demo, which is just a little right scale demo wiki and the wiki comes up and works quite nicely. So that's that one. The second IP address is the internal IP address. <clears throat> We're going to see that later inside the new Reddit Relic Analytics. So I've got a server up and running. I've got my Ruby on Rail applications running, and I want to see more information about what it's doing, alerts, escalation, monitoring. Within RightScale, we do a really, really good job of telling you about the basic iron, the machine, what's going on. The top plot here is the free disk space. It looks like I'm hitting 40% of the disk space on my root partition, and it's climbing pretty fast for running for one week. I better look at log rotate and find out why my logs aren't rotating correctly here and reducing the amount of space used on the root partition. And I got pretty heavy load on the CPU. This is because I'm running a load tester on this machine. This is idle time the number of threads in the MySQL database. Let me just give you a quick peek on what you can see in MySQL. A lot of information, a lot of graphs and plots about what's going on inside the, the database, but it stops right there. I can't really dive into the application, the controller, the pages, the response time. And that's where New Relic steps in. And I want to show you now the tight integration that takes you from this board, which is where the demo sort of stops for me, and takes you into what's going on inside New Relic and how deep they can go inside this little application we're talking about. And also because mine is mechanically challenged by a mechanical load generator, uh, we're going to dive into an actual customer application. So you go over to the left-hand menu, click on Report New Relic RPM, and you can see over here some of the information that's provided by New Relic for our little application the percentage of CPU, the percentage of memory, and things that are going on. And that tight integration is actually embedded right here in the RightScale dashboard. But it doesn't really stop here. And I'm going to let Steve take over from here, because now we're going to jump over by clicking on one of these buttons here into the new Relic application and show you how deep we can go into the application. So Steve, you ready to take over the screen from me? Yeah. 
Ed, Ed yeah. before we before we turn it over to Steve, just looking at some of the questions here, I, I think the audience would benefit from help them understand the steps you just took through took them through. One, do you need to do that every time? And why are we dealing at a server template level as opposed to bundling new images? Well, that's an excellent, excellent question. So let me dive back very quickly and show you those pieces. But I won't take too terribly much time. There's a little quick thing that allows me to actually go back to my server itself. Once I've built a template, I can reuse that template all I want. What the template's doing is providing a collection of scripts that happen during three periods of time of the life of the server. One is when it's booting. Two is during operation. Three is while the server is being decommissioned. So I'm going to open up the boot scripts and explain to you what's going on here. If I bundle a server, what I'm basically doing is taking a machine that's currently running, and I'm taking a snapshot or image of that machine, and then rebooting that machine from the image. What RightScale does instead is we take an image of the machine that has never been booted. You could say an unused or fresh image, never been launched once. And we launch the server from that image like it's a fresh boot. The big advantage here, of course, is we know the history of every single bit in your server, and there's no possibility of some corruption happening during the time you configure the server, propagating till later. And we add on top of that these scripts that add all the components that are required for your server. Now, if you have a large collection of different types of servers, if you bundle the AMI, you would have to rebundle every time you made a change to any of these values. By using a stack of scripts, which is what we like to call it, of write scripts, you can alter these parameters that are in blue each time you launch the server or not. That's up to you. But the good thing is you now have a far fewer amount of things to watch out for in your life cycle, and each component stands on its own. So when we update the operating system for patches, which we do fairly frequently, you can simply reapply these write scripts and relaunch the server with only a few very minor changes to the template. So to answer your question succinctly, no. You write the template one and once and use it many, many times. Second of all, you can launch this template with the default values over and over again, which is what we do for array grow and array shrink in scale up and scale down. And you can also change them, which is nice. You can alter small things like the name of the application you're running or its application IP address or something simple that you want to change. You can do that on the fly. So that gives you a quick explanation of why we do this. The advantage is much, much better life cycle cost, much, much better source code and configuration management control. Great. Appreciate that. Thank you. So Steve, yeah. So Steve, back over to you. Um, where we were before um, we, we um, were interrupted by the question is looking at the tight integration. So he's clicked on the button and moved over to the screen so he can see my application now from inside New Relic. So take it, Steve. Okay, thank you, Ed. So uh, can you guys see my screen okay? We had to do a little switch over there. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I can see what you look like from the customer's point of view, so I'll be watching for you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So what we're looking at here, as Ed pointed out, we, we switched over and uh, we're looking at, a, at one of our customers, uh, the customer Shopify, you can see the name here, and, and we do have their permission to, uh, to see their, their data. Um, okay. So Ed, you can see me. I, I got a question here that says they don't see our screen. Okay. Yeah, I can see your screen just fine as the customer, so I'll tell you if there's a problem. Don't worry. Okay, okay, I got you. So let me uh, just just try to continue because I've only got about ten minutes uh, to show you some really cool things uh, with RPM, and uh, our product actually does does a lot, and so it's it's hard to do in that amount of time. And I'd like to uh, up front here just go ahead and extend the offer to uh, you know we'll we'll be glad to do a one-on-one -on -one with you. Uh, we'll give you our emails later, but you can shoot us an email and we'll we'll give you a more detailed walkthrough. But essentially what we're looking at here is a, is a top-level dashboard. Uh, similar to what you saw, this is the same piece that's integrated with RightScale console. And what, what you're looking at is a high-level summary of the key metrics about your applications. And you see that, uh, that, that actually the applications are at the top and that 
we have another section down at the bottom which uh, lists the host. And as you install your instances and spin them up with RPM install, they'll automatically uh, appear here in the host section. And then, then you can later roll them up into applications, whether it's your production apps, uh, staging, or, or, or whatnot. So when you, so this gives you, you know, a nice uh, consolidated view. The numbers at the top are aggregates of the individual instances at the bottom. And when, uh, when you have a problem or a condition happening, they, they change colors, and we have thresholds that you can set and control that sort of uh, behavior as well. Now I'm going to just go into the response time. Depending on where you, uh, where you come in uh, to the application or, or when you start drilling in, it, 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 uh, most of the time, it depends on the problem at hand. If it's a database issue, you might start with the database, and that'll take you to a screen appropriate for that, throughput, uh, page request, and so forth. Let's drill into the, uh, to the response time, since this is probably the more common screen and a, and a good place to just do the demo. Uh, you know, we land on a screen such as this, and here I've, I'm given an overview of the performance of my application and all the things that are, that are really key to that. And, and what we're looking at is controlled uh, by this drop-down. I can change to a different application or a host. I can see all the instances running on that host or a specific instance. It's also tied to this time window here, so we're looking at the last 30 minutes. And over the last 30 minutes, we can see that the, the throughput is hovering around 1,000 requests uh, per minute and that our response time is holding within a reasonable range as well. And so I can change that to, uh, to, to see if it uh, holds true for the last 24 hours or several days. And as you can see, it, that's, uh, that is indeed the case, that our throughput holds relatively uh, the same. A little dip here at midnight, response time is good. Now down here in the bottom left, what we're looking at is a list of uh, controller actions. And this is showing the slowest controller actions that have been running within my time window. So we're, you know, we, we can click on these to get additional data. And the data that shows up over here on the right is now um, you know, showing me the average time or, or where, the, where time is being spent in the particular controller action. So I've gone from, a, from an aggregate view of the performance of my app as a whole down to specific controller actions. And then within that controller action, where is time being spent? So here, so, you know, real quick, go ahead. So, so did you have to configure all this and type in all these names of controllers? And how, how did it figure out all this information? Yeah. No, that's a good question, Ed. This is all automatically discovered. So by, by dropping the plug-in uh, into your application, we automatically uh, uh, monitor all the key components of basically of, a, of, of the M MVC pattern, the model view controller pattern that Rails apps are typically built around. So, so with that one action of adding the plug-in with the credentials to my Rails application, you can instrument my deployment to this level of detail. Absolutely. Just, uh, just the, the, the simple install that you, uh, that you showed us uh, gets us to this point, and that's all we've done. So let me, uh, let me show you a little bit more detail, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll just hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, we'll shed some more light on what we can do. The, uh, so when we're, we're looking at this pie graph, again, this is, uh, this is still an average of, of where time is being spent. Down here we see the time series for this controller and this action. So I can see, um, as I hover over this, the, the response time and the throughput at the various points. Now if I click on this, I can, I can go another step deeper. And here I can analyze this controller action in more detail. I get a summary up here at the top left to see average response time, mins, max, standard deviation, and so forth. Um, I've got options here to get more detail, so I may drill in and, and take a look at, the, at a view such as this that gives me the average, the min, the max, and standard deviation as shown in, this, uh, in, in the top graph, and then down at the bottom we have the throughput. Um, I have options to compare with other time periods, so I, I may be looking at a graph like this, and you can see that we do have some spikes upwards of a minute. So this may be, you know, kind of concerning to me. I may want to keep this under, let's say, half a minute. It just depends on what it is that it's doing. Um, and so I may want to compare it with yesterday to see how, you know, performance was has changed. And I can see that it's relatively within the noise. Uh, same kind of uh, pattern there, uh, essentially. Now, if I want to get down to see exactly, maybe in, in more detail, what's happening within this controller, I can go to our transaction traces. And our, and our a transaction trace is, is the execution of a single call into that controller action. And so we can see here that we've captured several. RPM does this automatically. And we've captured over here the, the time you can see that 
you know, we we stay under half a second, and then up here at the top we've got several that are that are getting longer, and the top one is actually over two minutes long. And so I can drill into that to get more details, and I'll click on that link, and that'll take me to um, to a specific to details on a specific transaction. So you know, just keep in mind that what we've looked at so far has been aggregate values, starting at the application level down to the controller level, uh, looking at the average for the for the controller itself, and now this is a specific transaction. And I can see that this transaction, while it took um, you know, upwards of two minutes, uh, it only spent about six minutes or six seconds uh, burning CPU. So, so it spent an awful lot of time uh, in a wait state. Now, if I had it turned on, I could, I could see parameters that were captured. Um, I can actually add custom parameters to get more details about the transactions. And then down here at the bottom, I've got options to, uh, to, to ex um, examine the transaction in more detail. This view here gives me a summary of where time's being spent. I can see that the uh, that this call here roughly uh, it, you know is probably probably a, a database call, and I can see that we've uh, we've probably got some HTTP request activity going on. If I look at the uh, detail tab, this will take me to a view that breaks out the uh, the call stack or the, the sequence of calls that the transaction took as it executed or, or went through the, the path through my application. And so I can see um, that I have a number of these product image save operations. Looks like they hit the database. I can see the exclusive time and, and uh, the, uh, both when it started as well as, as how much time was spent in each component. So I can get this view of it. But probably uh, you know, to cut to the chase, which in a lot of cases with Rails apps, as you guys know, uh, the database is a big culprit in performance issues. And this tab gives me a detailed breakout of all the SQL statements that are being executed or that, had, that were executed by this transaction. And again, it's, uh, it's ordered by sequence, by the timestamp, the duration, and if it's a, uh, over a significant period of time, such as this one, I can click on that link and I can get a SQL explain stack to further see the exact uh, stack, uh, stack trace of, of what's going on. That's really remarkable. So we've gone all the way from simple things like looking at the disk gets full and the CPU's loaded, drilling all the way down to every single SQL query line on a long query on a bad page with this tool. This is fantastic analytics. That, that's right, Ed. Thanks, thanks for uh, making that comment. It's, uh, it really does give you the, that ability to go from a, from a top-level view down to a specific transaction. Well, no, I, I'm interested much. in these question marks, by the way. Why am I not seeing the real data on the screen? Why am I seeing question marks here? Well, we, we actually uh, we do that intentionally. We remove the, uh, the values that are typically put into an insert statement such as this because they could contain credit card data or uh, social security numbers or so forth. So that's an option. Oh, you can actually turn it on to where you can see it, but in most cases uh, people do like to keep that, that stuff hidden. Ah, oh, very good. So you obscurify the data. That's excellent. We do. So let me uh, show you just a couple of other points because I know I'm running short on time here, and I just want to point out that we have a lot of options. Uh, again, be glad to go over these in more detail one-on-one. -on -one. Um, a lot of our screens or, or a lot of our you know, pages and tools are performance-related, so active record details about how it's performing, uh, time consumption graphs, uh, something called Index Hunter, cluster breakout. I can view the performance of all my instances compared to each other. But we also look at things like errors that are not necessarily performance-related. But since we're uh, running within your application, we can capture those. Um, so, for instance, here we're, we're showing errors that are not captured and processed by your application. So, um, in a lot of cases for uh, you know paths and whatnot that people are typing in or phishing attempts, they're they're not as necessary or, or important to worry about. But records not found from Active Record, uh, that may be something of interest to go look at and see what kind of query was trying to uh, you know call a uh, call a table that's, that's not there. Um, there's some other options uh, at, at the different levels. We have a controller summary view, deployments. Um, and if you remember what I mentioned in the, in the slide where our product is provides uh, you know, good functionality or, or equal functionality, I should say, from a monitoring, troubleshooting, and performance tuning standpoint. And in the uh, in, in the upper levels, as well as in some of these lower levels, we have some nice tools to help you with uh, scalability and, and tuning aspects. And the scalability analysis is one such tool that we have. And what this allows you to do is to actually plot your response time uh, against your request 
coming in. And so you can see how your application scales over time. And so what you're looking at here is response time on the left, request on the bottom. And I can see that as the requests increase, that I do get a slight increase in this average response line. And that's that orange line uh, that you see going across there. And then the scatter plot that you see with the different colored dots, those correspond to the actual measurements taken and a time of day that you see over here on the right. So what you can see is that uh, you know, the low request and the late part are the early hours, but during the day, during the prime time, is where we start getting this, this increase in request. So, so let me make this clear. The horizontal axis is the speed of the request, so the rapidity of the request, requests yes. per second. Or volume, the, is it? Yes. The, the volume of requests. The vertical is the actual response time the user sees, and the color is what time of day that request happened. That's correct. Okay, so I can find out during my highest time of the day how much slowness or how much lack of performance is happening. And those outliers way at the top show us that if you really pound on that server, it slows down. In other words, we're deployed about right, but um, if we had much more traffic, we would start to slow down. So our scalability is in question here. Exactly right. That's, that's, that's exactly it. Uh, it. So what we look for here is a horizontal graph, but you can see that uh, we're beginning to scale up. And, and while the difference is not uh, that much, they, they, they are still, this application is still within a reasonable tolerance level. Um, if, it, if it started curving up uh, with more of a traditional hockey stick, that might be something uh, to take a look at in more detail. Yeah, and I noticed that takes a day or two before you see it, right? That, you don't see that graph the first hour. That's, uh, well, yeah, that's correct. And kind of by definition, you do need uh, to run for a period of time uh, to, to get meaningful data out of it. So, uh, yeah. um, so we, we, have, you know, we break out the kind of the key areas. Response time is your overall application performance. And then, we, then here we're looking at CPU. So if you saw the response time going up, another, you know, another question might be, what is my application doing? Is it spending a lot of time burning CPU? In other words, am I doing a lot of uh, you know, processing, churning through result sets before I display them, maybe in a view? Or uh, my database, uh, maybe you know, uh, if the CPU is looking relatively flat, which is what you look for, so you want to kind of have a consistent amount of CPU per request. Uh, the next question as well is the database getting slower. And, and in this case, that looks exactly it. Remember, we're looking at, at, at a real application. And so they had a slight increase in response time, and it looks like the database is probably the primary culprit, that as they scale up and get up into the 1,500 towards 2,000 uh, requests, uh, you know, their, their database is beginning to slow down. So, so within right scale, if I saw a hockey stick like this that's starting to tip upwards, I might want to go from a large instance on my database to an extra large instance and see if I could flatten that out or perhaps shard my databases into multiple database shards. That's correct. That, now, so that this is a great be... tool to make those decisions, isn't it? It is. It's an excellent tool, and we have others uh, that I, you know, they're on the drawing board that, that are going to help in that aspect as well. And then just in, along that line, uh, you prompted me, uh, Ed, just to you know, mention that this is our cluster view. So this is showing the, the load, the throughput, the response time, and CPU over time for all of my instances. So this is another way that we can see that uh, you know, maybe how much CPU each instance is, is consuming and whether I need to provision more or less. So we're coming up on a, a quarter till. So let me just ask my moderators uh, if, if, if we have time to continue down this path, or do we want to cut over to questions? Uh, we, we have a few more minutes, Steve. Why don't you go ahead? OK, OK. I wanted you to well, talk about those emails I've been receiving. So not only do we have all this stuff on the screen, but you've also been sending me incident emails and uh, a weekly report I think I just got. That's correct. So. RPM will summarize. You can opt in or opt out, so just uh, you know, mention that, that up front for people who don't want to get spammed. But uh, we do uh, automatically send a summary report each week of the performance. Uh, incidents are also uh, something that is, uh, that, is, that is used within RPM to, to notify you of conditions of interest. And so for instance, uh, the, the lights that you saw on the main dashboard, and I mentioned uh, setting those thresholds, uh, that's important to do so that uh, uh, so that RPM can you know, properly manage uh, maybe notifying you when conditions uh, that you want to be notified about are, are happening, such as CPU. And so this is showing those thresholds and showing the CPU over time. And we can see the period where the incident occurred. Now RPM will open and close instance, uh, incidents automatically. And uh, you can have those sent via email, RSS feed. We also have some integration options with Campfire. 
uh, so that you can have these posted into maybe a chat room where your developers are hanging out. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's a, another incident type uh, that's actually a threshold violation. Uh, we also have a, a kind of a built-in heuristic that uh, RPM will monitor things over time, and, and in a condition such as this, they'll let you know when uh, when a value has deviated significantly from what it considers the norm. So in this case, uh, we have you know a, an increase in errors, and that that would have that triggered the creation of an incident. And this is very similar to the alerts and escalation the right scale dashboard does, but of course we, we will address it more at the, at the metal, at the iron level, and you're way down here at the application level. And by the way, when you sign up for New Relic through the right scale dashboard, the email address to use will be your right scale email address, but don't worry, you can go into New Relic and edit that address later if you want your New Relic messages to come to a different address. It's easy to change. Exactly. So. Another uh, another feature, while we've got just a few minutes here to, to point out, is uh, something called deployments. And uh, built into RPM is the ability to, to track uh, or to measure the, the key metrics and, and roll them up um, at each deployment point so that you can compare how well the application is behaving over time. And so we see here, you know, since uh, back in February, Shopify has made a, a number of deployments, and we can look at the request. Uh, we can also look at the response time uh, to see if it's holding steady or see if it's getting worse, how much CPU is being used. And I'm actually going to switch over to another tab, and I'm going to show you guys uh, our own uh, application. We actually use RPM to monitor RPM, and uh, I just think it tells a good story. Unfortunately, um, we've had so many deployments that we've rolled off some of the data that actually shows the true picture, but what I wanted to point out was the we have been able to we've been able to increase um, our capacity to, to grow the number of requests per minute it's up to a, to around 20,000 requests per minute and that's that's doubled over the past six months um, and we've been able to do it while keeping the response time relatively c consistent you can see here all the way up and we're still at about 46 milliseconds so we've we've almost doubled the throughput and the capacity of our application keeping the acceptable you know, response time within an acceptable range. And you also look at the memory. We've, we've actually made some optimization and improvements where we've reduced memory usage from close to 600 megs down to around 400 megs. CPU is relatively the same. But where we paid for it or where what we, uh, you know, what we had to pay for it is with the uh, database. And so we're actually just getting more use out of our database, which we went from uh, you know, 92% up to roughly 184%. I understand that that's kind of a weird percentage number, and we'd be glad to explain that at another you know, if we have time. But, um, but essentially, what that's showing is that uh, we're we're getting much more use out of our database uh, while keeping uh, the, all the key metrics uh, within the, the tolerances that we're after. So that's something that's built in, and is really handy to see how you're doing over time. Hey, Steve, can you uh, and, we have a uh, question on what's what's that AppDeck score column? Oh yeah, I uh, I was kind of afraid that one would. would Come up, but well, that's actually a, a new feature that, that will be coming out uh, within the next uh, next release, um, which is going to be in a month. And that's uh, that's that's an, a different way of tracking success of transactions. It's a it's a it's a metric that lets you uh, quickly determine is your application behaving uh, in acceptable tolerance ranges. And I, I, you know, I really can't say much more about that. But we'll be we'll we'll we're going to have some videos and some uh, you know some information out about that shortly. Sounds like a sneak preview to me. Well, well. Yeah, it was a, probably a sneak preview, and I hope I don't get myself in trouble showing this. But let me, uh, what I wanted to do, uh, just show you also on these deployments, is how they, uh, they will show up in the graphs if you look at a long enough time frame. And I'm just going to go back real quickly to a, to a graph here, and I'm going to increase this to like three days. And you'll see these vertical bars in the graph, which also so let you kind of visually see how the performance is changing between releases. So these vertical bars are where we've had deployments. And I can see, uh, you know, quickly uh, if things are getting better or worse. And I can click on a graph there or, or that vertical bar to come into a window here like this, and I can see uh, the response time versus errors, database, CPU, so forth. I can look at the change log, see what was changed uh, at that time, and so forth. And a change report, which will actually... Um, run and, and show me the, some of the, the, the key metrics and if they're, how they've changed from this release to previous releases. 
it seems like a wonderful life cycle tool that I can, I can do a major change in my deployment, even a minor change in my deployment on one day and look at the previous day and see whether or not I made progress or I went backwards uh, by comparing today from yesterday um, after making a small change in my application or even a large change in my application. Exactly. And so that can be important from, you know, again, a troubleshooting standpoint as well as a tuning standpoint. And that's, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's, that's, that's one of the unique uh, features of, of RPM is that ability to run around the clock in production and gather this kind of data. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of products on the market that do bits and pieces of it, but when you put it all together, um, I, I think that's what really makes this unique. Hey, Steve, what, what do users expect in terms of performance overhead in doing all this instrumentation? Well, it, it's not free. Um, you know, we, we don't shy away from that, but we, we have a lot of experience. Um, we've, the, the, whole, the company is, while it's relatively small, we've done this in a previous life and another technology, and um, I, I, you know, I can't give you a fixed percentage, you know, what it is that, uh, what kind of overhead that we, that we impart, but I can tell you that it's, uh, that it's, it's very small. We, uh, and, and in relative to what you monitor, but we've got a lot of experience in knowing what are the right things to monitor. And essentially, you don't want to monitor things that, ex that, that execute really fast. Um, the, the monitoring probe itself can you know, be as much as a setter or a getter it takes to execute, for instance. But relative to a query, relative to a two or 300 millisecond uh, query, you know, what is uh, five milliseconds on top of that to measure it? So um, a lot of experience in tuning into the product as far as um, actually, you know, or you know, keeping the overhead low. And I'm, I'm being told here by my engineers that we actually do measure it at around 2 to 3 percent additional overhead. That's kind of a, a target range that we would try to keep it in. Excellent. And, and this is completely decoupled from the app, is that correct? So if your system goes down, this does not impact your Rails app at all in terms of request time? Excellent question, Josh, and that, that is correct. So your so the agent is designed to run, and if it can't connect, it, it, it won't it impact your application. Um, you know, uh, now, and the only reason why I'm stumbling here is, is uh, we, we may have some people on the line that may beg to differ. We, we have had a, a time in the, in the past where, where a condition has happened where it's, it's caused some to slow down, but they, uh, we were able to, to, to fix that re really quickly, and now we've, we've provisioned for that in the future going forward. Great. And then in the, case, in the case of an outage, is it saving the information that's already gathered? while it can't connect, or is it losing that monitoring info? Yeah, that's, that's a real good question. The, uh, and we're, we're actually debating on, on what exactly, uh, how best to address that. T today we will aggregate the numbers, so uh, when, when you connect back up, uh, you, you, do, you do get an aggregate value reported back to our server as to say, you know, what was the application doing over the past three hours while it couldn't connect or something. Um, but uh, we're, we're, actually, we're looking at other ways of doing that as well. So, so you know, you won't get the you won't get the detailed data points because we, we we don't have anywhere to store it on your application. We don't we don't want to write to disk. We don't want to store it in memory. We can't do that kind of stuff. But we can aggregate the values and report those aggregate values back. Fantastic. Well, we're getting close to the top of the hour here, so we should uh, we should move to wrap up here. But just to confirm, Stephen Ed, so everything you just showed us there that can be enabled off of a single plugin. There's no additional configuration you have to do. Absolutely. Yeah, that's really all you have to do. So the most important part, part is to sign up for New Relic through the New Relic RPM uh, uh, click, which is in the accordion menu on the far left under report, and then take that credential and make sure to add that to the New Relic write script. And everything else you can do um, from within the New Relic website or within the My Write Scale dashboard, and you don't really need to um, collect anything else uh, from the application. It discovers the rest of it. So without further ado, I think WriteScale has some very interesting things to announce. So um, there's a promotion code I see. <laughs> there is, there is. So first off, Ed and Steve, thank you both very much. Um, we will keep the Q&A window open for about another 15 to 20 minutes, so feel free to stick around and ask additional questions. But a couple closing items here. If you would like a, a live demo, a personalized demo of anything that you saw here, uh, right scale and New Relic, please get in touch with us at either email or phone. Um, we do have free right scale accounts, and as uh, we mentioned earlier, RPM Lite is available at no additional charge on our free accounts, so you can try this all out for free. And then that promotional code that you see there, that is for 30 days of free RPM Gold. 
Um, so just enter that promotion <coughs> code in with New Relic, and you'll have the opportunity to try out a lot of the features that you saw Steve take us through today. Hey, um, hey, J go ahead. hey Josh. Josh, can I just interrupt you here for a minute? I just want to make sure that people are clear that uh, that 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 code is for the higher level, the paid levels. But there there is a free level that that you can still use with you know without the code, and and you get that with your right scale account. Um, but the code would be to upgrade and try the higher level features for a period of time. That's good. Yeah, thanks for the clarification, Steve. That's great. And of course, if you're new to the cloud and just want to investigate a little more and and try it out and see what the benefits are, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us. And then finally, if you are an ISV uh, and you're looking to find ways to deploy and make uh, accessing your app in the cloud easier and quicker, uh, please get in touch with us. Um, New Relic, as you can see, has done a lot of great integration within RightScale to make deploying the cloud very easy, uh, both initially and an ongoing management standpoint, and we're more than happy to engage and do the same for you. So thanks, everyone, for joining us. And again, we'll keep the Q&A log open. Feel free to fire away. And also, any questions that we aren't able to get to uh, in the remaining 10, 15, 20 minutes or so, uh, we will be following up individually with each of those questions via email. Thanks again, and have a great day, everyone. Thanks, Josh. It was a pleasure. And thanks, Steve. It was wonderful working with you, Relic. You bet. Thanks, guys.